Welcome to That's What She Said about the Bible, a podcast by Wycliffe College. That's What She Said is a podcast devoted to telling the stories of historical women who taught others about the Bible from the pulpit and from the page. What did they write? What did they say? And why have we never heard of many of them? Join your hosts, Dr. Marion Taylor and Kira Molman, as they dig up the words of these forgotten women and explore their lives, their influences, and their relevance for today. For more information and episodes, visit our website at www.wickliffcollege.ca slash podcast. Mary, I thought we could start with you telling us about how you got involved in this kind of research of women interpreters in history. About 20 years ago, I was teaching a class at Wycliffe College on the history of interpretation. And we were looking at 19th century responses to higher criticism by the church. And a woman in my class asked a question. She said, could I do a paper on a woman interpreter of scripture? And her question really changed my life because I was trained as a biblical scholar. I had always been interested in questions of interpretation. But the, all my research and all the books that I had read in preparation for a career in teaching Old Testament were really written by men. I didn't know any books written by women before the 1970s on the Bible. And so I thought there have to be books by women on the Bible. Women have been more than half of the church forever. So of course women read and studied and maybe even published on the Bible. So I began to research the question of women interpreters of the Bible, and I soon found out that I wasn't alone in that quest. I read a book called Notorious Voices by Marla Salvage, and in the preface to her book, she writes about her doctoral exams, and in she had a question on the history of interpretation, and she was given a list of 50 men to research for her project. And she said to her esteemed supervisor, Fred Danker, could I do, could I include a few women on the list? And he said, there are no worthy women. And she was um, kind of surprised. And then he went on to say, but maybe one day you'll be on that list. So he wasn't trying to be anti-women or or anything like that, or dismissive, but he, like all the rest of us, had studied the great books and the great ideas. Um, And they were all, as the history had been remembered, they were all the great books written by great men and the great ideas men have had. And there were no women on that list. So she set out to find some women, and she did. She found some so-called notorious voices throughout history that had had some revolutionary ideas. So that was a beginning point, and then I also found a book written on women interpreters by a Canadian woman, an English scholar, Patricia Demers in Edmonton, and she had listed a number of women. And then as I expanded my search, I looked at historians who had found women, English scholars, French scholars, and the list got bigger and bigger. And so that was the beginning of the project. And then I talked to um, Carrie Newman, a publisher, and he said, it would be a great idea to write a book on women interpreters. You should write a dictionary, women interpreters. You could write small, medium, and large entries. And I thought, how can I possibly do that? I have three young children. (laughs) So the idea didn't die. It was on hold, and it was a project I worked on in the evenings often. This is 20 years ago. Yeah, and then I got some grant money, and that helped a lot in terms of expanding the research base. I had graduate students, I had uh, other students at Wycliffe uh, join the project, I had colleagues and friends who joined the project, and soon we were getting lots of women. And we had a great Excel chart with all the names of women. So it was very exciting. So women did publish, but the it's, it is a challenge to find women's writings because we didn't know women's names And we didn't know the names of the books they published. So how do you find those women? I remember you telling me that there was a kind of breakthrough in finding some of these women's names. Do you want to tell us about that? 
Sure. It's a great story. Um, my friend and colleague, Heather Weir, was my research assistant, and she was an engineer and very um, up on technology and resources on the internet. So she said, let's look at the British Library findings. And she had the brilliant idea to type in Mrs. as author and Bible as subject. So all of a sudden, we got lots of hits because women in the 19th century didn't publish under their own first names, but under their names of their husbands. So we had Mrs. Baxter, Mrs. Thompson. And all of a sudden, we thought there are lots and lots of women. Then we expanded the search, and we I remember Googling common Victorian children's names. And I typed in every girl's name I could find, Elizabeth, Mary, Joanna, Julia. And we put in that as the name with Bible as subject, and we got lots, lots more hits. So all of a sudden, when I knew no women, we knew hundreds of women. And then was the second part of that is how do we find their books? And so I became... Uh, I scoured libraries and uh, used bookstores, and it was so exciting to find these books. And it actually changed, I had a visceral experience when I got a box of books, and I would pick up the book and hold it in my hand and thought, and I would think, some a woman wrote this 200 years ago, and it's a commentary on the Bible. How exciting is that? And it was very exciting. It was, she's, she became a forgotten foremother for me that I didn't know. And I thought, if women were writing commentaries 200 years ago, why didn't I know about it? And it, that would became an interesting question too. Why were these women's writings forgotten and not remembered? Because a lot of them are very popular in their own day, multiple editions, uh, endorsed by the church, but why have they been forgotten and not included in any of the great books list or uh, any of our reading lists? So that was a kind of an, a question that was haunting me also, but one that wasn't part of that initial research. So our initial project was to find the women, and, and we did. So have you been still trying to figure out the answer to that next question of why have these women been forgotten? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> I think there are, there are many answers to that question. Why have the works of women been hidden? And this is across disciplines. This is across found. disciplines. It's not just in and and Bible. when you talk to people in English, in music, in uh, any discipline, in medicine, they, they are doing projects on re recovering the early women and then retelling their history to include them. So I don't think anybody was trying to, uh, you know, suppress women at that point. Uh, but women were not involved in establishing the canon of what the great books were. And the great books are usually associated with the universities and the church. And early women were not allowed to go to university or have a theological education. And they certainly weren't allowed to have positions of leadership in the church. And so their ideas didn't become part of that tradition of great ideas or great books. So it wasn't intentional, but they became hidden and forgotten. Some ideas of some books were, were hidden or lost intentionally, like the books of heretics that were burned. And there were women who were heretics. But a lot of them were just forgotten. And uh, one example would be... Um, I was researching the writings of Christina Rossetti, one of the most prominent, brilliant Victorian poets. And there was a doctoral dissertation written on her commentary on the book of Revelation. So Rossetti was a devout Christian, and all, almost all her poetry is just interlaced with scripture and allusions to scripture. But she also wrote a commentary on the book of Revelation called In the Face of the Deep. And she wrote a commentary on the Ten Commandments. So a doctoral student in English wrote his thesis on Rossetti's commentary on Revelation and found in the British Library 30 other commentaries by women on the book of Revelation. 
Many of them were by anonymous, and he assumed anonymous was a woman, which I don't think it, anonymous is always a woman, but often it's a woman. But he also found a lot of these books had uncut pages, which means you need to get a knife and open the, you need to cut the pages. And so they you can had read never it. been opened. They've never been opened, certainly not since they've been in the library. So I thought, 30 commentaries on one book. How could this be? And none of my colleagues, of course, had ever heard of these books, my New Testament colleagues. So there is, it's like a, a treasure trove, right? We have women's writings on the Bible, and that allows us to open, to ask new questions. For example, do women read the Bible differently than men? We have a new database that we've never had to ask that question. That's really exciting. One of the things that we've talked about is the importance of reading the Bible with the dead. So one of the things that you just mentioned is that this helps us create a new database for do women and men read the Bible differently? Why else is it important to find these women's voices? That's a great question. Uh, reading the Bible with the Dead is the title of a book uh, written by John Thompson, and it's one of my favorite books. He argues, I think correctly, that we can never read the Bible well or properly without reading the Bible with our foremothers and forefathers because uh, they saw things in the Bible. They used methods that maybe we've forgotten, and we can benefit from them. We can often make assumptions about how some of the great theologians in the past perhaps neglected the stories of women or were not bothered by some of the stories about violence and women in the Old Testament, for example. But when you go back and you read them, you realize they were very troubled by these stories. Calvin and Luther, for example, were very troubled by, say, the story of the Levite's concubine. So you read it and say, well, they weren't anti-women in that sense. They were troubled by the morality of the story. So it actually corrects some misreadings of contemporary feminists who say, well, all the men just neglected those stories. Well, they didn't. So it becomes, uh, we, we get a fuller reading of texts by reading with our forgotten mothers and fathers. Also, they have ideas that are good to recover. And, and that's when we, we think, wow, these women thought that, these men thought that. So reading, for me, reading with my dead foremothers, <laughs> reading with the dead, has shown me that questions I had as a, a, a woman who was studying theology for the first time with all these questions about women's roles, these were not new questions. And that the answers that are put forward today about how to answer these hard questions, our foremothers of faith had already asked these questions and come up with great answers. And I thought, why didn't we know these answers? Because we could have saved a lot of time. So the sad part of this story is that we see over centuries women especially asking questions about women's roles in the church and coming up with answers and then their books were forgotten. And then the next generation of women faced the same problem and they came up with answers which for the most part were the same but then their work was forgotten. So it's kind of a sad litany of forgotten solutions. So women of each generation had to do the same hard work because we, had, we didn't have the shoulders of our foremothers to stand on. And that's a sad story. And that's a, sad, that's a story that kind of makes me angry some days. I think, I should have known this, right? I, it would have saved me a lot of trouble. And then I could have gone on to do other things if I hadn't had to figure that question out. You're almost wasting time repeating something that had already right. been solved. On the other hand, the repetitions themselves are important because it shows that women reading the Bible and coming to the idea that God loves women, that God allows women to serve in many capacities, and that Paul Paul's teachings about women keeping silent or women not teaching, there is what we would call now a, a, the pressure of the canon, the, the, the large story of God puts pressure on our, our answer to say, wait a minute, 
if you say all women in, at all times in every culture shouldn't teach or should keep silent, what about all the stories of women in the Bible where women were speaking, when women were leading, when women were prophesying and praying and doing evangelism and sitting at the feet of Jesus as a learner? Those stories press against that minority voice to say, you need to open this question up to a broader, to broader thinking. And women have done that throughout history. So it's exciting for me to say, wow, there's a minority voice another message that was always challenging the church's hard teachings about women saying you know women need to be silent in church right and and the women are saying well um what about our foremothers who weren't silent what about those preaching mothers and we have women preaching centuries ago one of my favorite women of the reformation is katarina zell who was married to uh, matthias zell who was a reformer he died, she was younger than he was, and he died early. And at his funeral, she stood by his graveside and preached a very long 45-minute sermon. <laughs> you think, wow, <laughs> who knew, right? Women were preaching at the time of the Reformation. And she was doing other um, types of interpretation, and we have her writings. So she's an amazing woman, but when we teach courses on Reformation, we often don't mention these great women who were serious, uh, they supported financially the projects, but they also did it more. They wrote letters, they influenced the men in their lives, and they certainly had a wide ministry to women and other men. Do you think that those women, like, like Zell, were seen as reformers in their own right Absolutely. at the time? Absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, Calvin sometimes talked about that bothersome little woman, right? <laughs> <laughs> he knew this woman, right? They had power. They had influence. Another thing that we talked about was how some of these women, the reformers were a long time ago, but there are also women that are in the 20th century that have already been forgotten. I was wondering if you could talk to us about, we, we've talked about Elizabeth Mary MacDonald as one example of a woman like that. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have been recently writing a chapter for a book called um, Breaking Silences, and I'm writing a chapter on the women in the 20 and 21st century. And I was looking for early women scholars, and I knew in the 19th century there were already women in, the, in the, um, America doing PhDs at a number of colleges, especially women's colleges. So they, women were being trained as scholars, uh, Hebrew, Aramaic, other biblical languages, New Testament, Old Testament. And then they were getting teaching jobs at a number of colleges, especially women's colleges, but also in Bible colleges. Um, Moody was a woman, was a, <laughs> Moody supported women because women, uh, he knew women could teach and preach and do evangelism. And he said, we need to train these women. So even at Moody Bible College, which is known as a very conservative place, certainly in, that, in those days, they had classes for women, and they had women in their pastoral classes. So in the early 20th century, that continued on, but there was a bit of a pushback. But nevertheless, there are great women scholars who became professors at a variety of colleges. So one of the women that I have... Uh, we found in our research was a Canadian woman who was born to uh, uh, a father who was a minister and a mother who valued education in the eastern provinces of, of Canada. And then the father moved to Toronto where they thought, oh, our daughter can go to university. So she did. She went to the University of Toronto, studied Near Eastern studies, and, and was a very brilliant linguist. She knew German and French. Hebrew, Akkadian, all kinds of ancient languages. So she went on to do her doctoral degree at the University of Toronto, and in 1929 she graduated with a doctorate. And she published her thesis. It was the first thesis to be published in a series put out by the University of Toronto Press in 1931. And the topic of her thesis was the position of women as reflected in the Semitic codes of law. And I thought, wow, here is a Canadian woman from Toronto who did her PhD on women and compared 
women in the Old Testament, their position in economics, in religion, in the family, to the position of women in Babylonian and Assyrian laws. It's a very interesting thesis. The sad thing for me in part of her story is that after she finished her degree, she was offered a job at the Royal Ontario Museum, which was a great job for a woman. And at that point, she would have been the most highly trained Canadian woman in biblical studies. But her father didn't believe women should work outside the home. And her mother was ill, so she had to take care of her mother. Not that she complained, but that was her role at that point. So she never went on to have a career in biblical studies or teaching or anything like that. So the other part of McDonald's life was, while she was a graduate student, her professor asked her if she would like to tutor others. And so she tutored a young man in German, and later on she married that same person. So the man she married went on, after his master's degree, to study theology at Wycliffe College and became an Anglican priest. So then she had a vocation as a minister's wife and they had one child. He went on to teach biblical languages at Trinity College and Wycliffe College, and he got a chair, a, a professor, professorial chair at Trinity to teach in the Oriental Studies. So the irony of it all is his wife was much more highly trained than he was in the subjects he got to teach at the university. He didn't I would love to be able to talk to them about that and, and how that worked out in their marriage. She would have assisted him in his work in the church. And I don't know what she was involved in, maybe Bible studies in the church, work with children, I'm not sure. But her daughter, in an interview with her daughter, the daughter says, my parents tried to keep up with the 13 languages they knew between each other and they wrote each other letters. And one Christmas, they wrote each other a fond Christmas card in Aramaic. That's so great. It's a great story, but it's sad that for me as a Canadian woman to say one of the first, my first mentors, who is so highly trained and such a brilliant scholar, didn't get to share her knowledge with her peers or her students. She didn't have that experience, which is which from my experience is a wonderful gift, right? So her story is sad in that sense for me, but there are many other women who did go on to have wonderful careers. And one of them, looking back, said, when she was in her 70s, said the high point in her career was to be in the classroom and to read a text of scripture and watch the faces of her students light up. And she said that, now that was wonderful experience. And I would say that's the same thing. So for me, I was the first woman to teach at Wycliffe and one of the early women uh, to teach theology in Toronto. But I wasn't the first at all because we have four mothers who are great scholars and teachers for generations, but we didn't know their stories. So finding these women has been very exciting for me. They, they, you look at their careers. Did they have families? Did they, how did they negotiate this world of you know, being a professional and being a family person? Many of our early women scholars and professors in the 20s and 30s of the, night of the 20th century, if they got married, they had to quit their job. Two of them were widowed and they got their jobs back. <laughs> and one of them married a professor at, uh, her name is Mary Lyman. She married a professor at Union Seminary. So they hired her at Union Seminary because she was married to a professor. So the, her interesting story is when he retired, and he was a lot older than she was, when he retired, they retired her also. And she said, but I didn't want to retire. I'm not done with my teaching career. So she went on to get a, a job teaching at a women's college in the South. And then after that, they invited her back to Union Seminary where she became the first professor, full professor at a seminary. And she became a dean of women and supported women in ministry and 
So her, her career went on way beyond that of her husband. But again, it's interesting to see the early struggles women had, which are actually not that different than some women today. You have to negotiate, um, you know, when it, if you're doing a doctorate and you get married, when is, when is it a good time to have children? When you're finishing your thesis, when you're on the tenure track, when you're trying to publish books. But we, women before us have figured, they've modeled for us different options. So I think that's an exciting story for me. Is we have, we have grandmothers and great-grandmothers who studied the scriptures, taught the scriptures, were scholars on the scriptures. And even in the 20th century, their works have been forgotten, unfortunately. Thanks, Marianne. Thanks for listening to That's What She Said About the Bible, a podcast by Wycliffe College. For more information and episodes, visit our website at www.wycliffecollege.ca slash podcast.